So hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 145 of Level Up, 60 minutes of live Q&A, where your questions, of course, drive the show. Um, Ella and Shanice are over in the social chat, so do please introduce yourself to them. Um, let them know your name and, of course, the city from where you're joining um, that would be really brilliant. Now, I'm going to post some links into the chat so that you can vote up the questions that you would most like answered. And of course, for you to add your own as well. Now, if your question is selected today, then your name's going to appear in the credits at the end of the show. So do get those questions in early because today is going to be an incredibly lively event because we're exploring one of those things about project management that really does polarize opinions. It, it's specifically what method should you choose for different project situations? Now, whether you're at one end of the spectrum or the other, whether you're a, a kind of a fan of agile or a, you know, a follower of waterfall methods, there is, I think it's fair to say, at least on social media, an increasingly polarized debate with supporters who are equally passionate um, around promoting one approach over the other. Now then, um, I'm also delighted for this to be joined by a really great panel of experts who can help us to explore and figure this out and so on. So let's jump straight in and meet them all. I'm delighted to welcome back uh, Farah Heba, who is an experienced product owner and a project management trainer. Describing herself as detail oriented, she designs and delivers a wide range of training and coaching for her clients across the agile and waterfall spectrum. And um, welcome back to Level Up, Farah. Lovely to see you. Thanks, Nick. I'm really happy to be part of this amazing panel and looking forward to answering questions. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Orlando um, Heimerick is a trainer and change guide over at La Hunt, um in the Netherlands. His background was as a practicing project manager where he rose to become, I think it was uh, the director of projects and implementation over at ANB. Um, ABN AMRO rather. Um, he's passionate about helping teams and organizations with change, achieve results, and also have a little bit of fun along the way as well. So welcome back to Level Up Orlando. Great to see you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Love to uh, have a great discussion. And uh, well, my favorite uh, statement is uh, projects are there because of the inability of the business uh, to start, perform, and to finish uh, adequate uh, projects. So I'd love to discuss that <laughs> with you. I think that's very true. I think we've all witnessed that firsthand, haven't we? And I have to say, in previous lives, of course, I've I've sometimes, I think, been the cause of some of that as well. Um, we have to admit that. So very good. Thank you very much, Orlando. Um, Mark, um, uh, Calvin yeah. Hoven is um, a broad, has a broad experience mm -hmm. in both um, public private partnership work and also risk management um, as a consultant, a trainer and a coach. Um, having had a wide range of experience in leading practice methods, he's an accomplished facilitator and developer of online simulation content that really do help professionals bring scenarios to life for his clients. So welcome to Level Up, Mark. Lovely to see you. Thanks, Nick. And I think uh, we're talking about Agile today, so uh, maybe we need to introduce that's an abbreviation. It stands for All Goes Into Lovely Enhancement. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Let's make a note of that. Um, uh, put it in the chat and then we'll get it out to the audience. I don't want to miss that one. I'm going to write that one down for sure. Thank you so much, Mark, for starting us off. Uh, Tomas joins us. Tomas Man Manugovic. Uh, he is the general manager, of course, of Grand Parade over in Poland, where he's an agile enthusiast and a coach, um, having conducted his first agile transformation back in 2009. He's also co-author of the leadership book, The Light Book, Two Insights for Leaders, and a regular keynote speaker. And um, Welcome back to Level Up, Tomas. Uh, sorry, we can't hear you, Thomas. 
Okay, so we'll come back to Thomas in a few moments when we figure out his um, audio. We've got a little bit of a glitch there. Adrian Pine um, completes our panel. He is, of course, Director of Consulting at Pine Consulting and a Fellow of the UK Association of Project Management, a community which he has been active in since the early 1990s. A champion of diversity and inclusion, Adrian is an accomplished author, um, including the book Agile Beyond IT, and he's a key supporter of Level Up. So welcome back to the panel, Adrian. Great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, yeah, this one's this one's going to be lively. Mm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. I think it's going to be exactly. just because it's the kind of thing that, you know, starts to prompt people, get them thinking and, you know, get them contributing. I can already see quite a lot of folks um, who are joining in the chat uh, for this conversation today. So that's really great to see. Um, Tomas, let's come back to you. Can you hear us now? And can we hear you? Yes, exactly. It should work now. Does work, yep, yep. Uh, so once again, uh, Nick, thank you very much for the invitation uh, because this debate between Agile and Waterfall uh, doesn't come along or not coming along. It's very, very uh, hot since, since I joined IT 17 years ago. So I'm glad to, to have the conversation with you guys today. Yeah, indeed. It, it's it's kind of something which has certainly run parallel, you know, with my career um, throughout with people having different thoughts at different stages. So excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Thomas. Our question master for today, I'm trying to keep good order amongst this <laughs> lively debate, is going to be Suchitra, Suchitra Jacob, who joins us from Bangalore in India. Um, welcome, Suchitra. Did you have a good weekend? Hello, Nick, and hi to the panelists and the viewers. Yes, my weekend was good, and now looking forward to asking the questions. All right. Okay. Well, as you can see, we've got people joining from all around the world. We've got Vicky uh, from Australia. We've got people who are joining from Europe. We've got some folks from the United Kingdom as well, um, including uh, Niraj as well. And oh, and uh, some folks from India too, which is brilliant. So let's jump straight in and we'll take our first question for the panel, if we may. All right. So our first question is from Ellie, who wants to know. Are there environments where Agile may not be preferable? Okay, very good. Uh, Thomas, why don't you start us off and then we'll hear from Adrian. Uh, yes, I would love to um, give a very quick example that I had like 15 years ago. Yeah, so the industry, medical industry is the, is the environment that Agile may not fit um, in, right. Uh, just because of the regulations and regulators that uh, projects needs to fulfill uh, when it comes to the health of the people. So this is the example that, that waterfall is, is, is better actually. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, certainly clinical trials, highly regulated, aren't they? And you must follow, quite rightly, you know, a set of very well-defined procedures and protocols. And even the storage of the data and the maintenance of the data has to be done to an international standard for the results of that trial to be recognised. So that's absolutely um, true. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, Adrian, your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Farah. Yeah, two quick points. First of all, uh, it's important to... Uh, be clear what Agile you're talking about. And I know that obviously the focus of today is on project management agility, uh, but of course, uh, agility, uh, the Agile Manifesto started out for the world of software development. Uh, so it's absolutely important. Those two things are completely different. Uh, the adaptations of, of, of agility are different and techniques from one don't necessarily fit in uh, another area. The second thing is, um, I think you have to look at the, the cultural thing because for, for projects to succeed uh, of any of any kind, uh, that depends on both what happens inside them and also what happens in their surrounding organizational landscape. And if you don't have an organizational culture, if you like, that supports agile working, so that's thing like delegation of sufficient authority, self-organizing teams, collaboration, da 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 da, -da then in those types of organization, uh, agility, uh, project management agility uh, is going to have a hard struggle to be effective. Mm, mm. It's certainly true because, you know, we tend to kind of join all 
all methods into these two very broad you know kind of scopes don't we we just kind of say waterfall or agile but actually there's a huge variety of different techniques tools and methods and and so on to be able to use across that spectrum so thank you Adrian. i think we're going to come back to that perhaps a little bit later on and um, farah your thoughts on are there any environments where agile may not be preferable yeah, and to go along what Adrian has just said, in fact, uh, you can always apply part of the agile mindset competence, but not, but to a given, uh, let's say, level. Um, I'll speak mainly about, let's say, contexts, because today a lot of sectors are embracing agile. But contexts that are challenging might be the ones in which uh, there are a lot of hierarchical levels. Um, also context in which there is not trust in not available or enough available clients. So when it comes to sectors, uh, if I go on on this one, I would say that uh, from my experience, it's a bit challenging to do agile in public administration and also in high regulated sectors like energy or nuclear, for example. Yeah, the, the regulation certainly comes into it. Although um, I was just recalling, you know, uh, in my own mind a few moments ago, how rapidly people did respond in the highly reg regulated world of vaccine production um, when the pressure was on. And in fact, although it's still a regulated environment, I think you could see evidence even within that. Um, strict way of working, that there was a lot of agile thinking going on behind the methods that were actually used. Um, let's hear from Orlando and then we'll come back to Adrian. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I do really agree about the mindset and the culture, which is really important. I'd like to dig a bit deeper because I think that the, um, uh, the uh, how um, uh, certain and how well known technology is and how the, the the project is working with and how certain or uncertain requirements are from uh, business sponsors from or from customers uh, that defines if there is a well more or less dynamics during the project and there are more or less complexities during the during the project and uh, that means that the more uh, uncertainties there are um, you are uh, required to move more, to, to need more agile to be uh, placed into the ways of working. Um, and there's one other thing uh, mentioned is the, um, the regulation project. When there is a certain deadline, I would prefer to, uh, to use some kind of uh, project management or coordination uh, compared to a scrum wise of working. Okay, thank you very much. I must admit, I rely a great deal on having a brilliant business analyst to help. Um, in, in my role, generally, I might have a vision, but I want to know from a technical point of view, what is the art of the possible? And without actually knowing that, without having a great BA, it's really sometimes quite hard to be able to lay out at the beginning everything that you're looking for. Whereas if you have a great BA team around you, you can kind of explore that together a little bit at the beginning. I don't know if that's cheating or not really. Um, Adrian, your thoughts again, and then we'll go to Mark. Absolutely. Just picking up on uh, and uh, something that uh, Farah was uh, saying about sort of the partial mindset. Um, and uh, I'm, in, in my book, I actually do uh, describe an example of a nuclear engineering program. They didn't realize it at the time, but the way in which they did that program was amazingly agile. Um, uh, behaviorally, they were given the space, they were given the delegated authority because they were the only people who could solve the incredible problems that no one had ever found in the world before. And it wasn't until I, they asked me to look at the program and I said, oh, do you realize you're doing this in a completely agile way? And they said, oh, are we? And the lessons from that were were amazing. So, you know, there was no way that their overall uh, uh, environment was, was an agile one. But uh, accidentally, uh, an agile program uh, in the nuclear industry had been created and was incredibly successful. Um, so there we go. Uh, excellent, excellent example. Thank you very much indeed, um, Adrian. Really appreciate it. Mark, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I was thinking about uh, agile project management, the best practice. And in Appendix B, they have the project approach questionnaire, 17 questions. 
And if everybody is not agreeing on the way we were working, maybe it's not a good thing to do full agile explicitly. But you could always go with the mindset and being very implicit and add some agile mindset to it. Be more transparent. Yeah, and this is this is indeed, isn't it, where that blend panel comes in and the experience of having, you know, somebody who's who's genuinely there to coach you, you know, who doesn't have kind of a vested interest, you know, in a particular outcome, but who can actually stand back and kind of say, look, in these situations, you may want to consider this, have a think about that, you know, and so on. And it helps you, it facilitates you in selecting the, the best method and tool, tools to be able to use. So Ellie, brilliant question to start the show. Thank you so much. Much. Let's um, head over to social if we can and see kind of what's happening there. We've got people joining from all around the world. So, Charles, thank you so much for your feedback, my friend. I'm not sure whereabouts in the world you are. I'll have to scroll back and try and find you because um, we've got a sea of comments already kind of coming in. Um, we've got people in Australia um, who are joining us. We've got Pavan who joins again from India. Thank you, Pavan. We regularly see you um, in the audience. And uh, Alex Alexander uh, joined us today from Germany, which is fantastic to see. So thank you, Alexander. Looking forward to your contribution, as we are from um, Bina as well, um, who's here in the United Kingdom. And Marta, we had a Polish show actually on Friday in local language. Tomas, a little bit of a wave to a fellow colleague from Poland. Uh, Marta's joining us um, from that country. A great adopter, actually. Fantastic government championing agile, championing digital transformation. Um, if you're sitting in a country thinking, what is my government doing for this? Well, look at some of the case studies coming out of Poland because it's a fantastic um, leadership role, thought leadership role that the Polish government has taken. And Vicky uh, from Australia as well. I'm imagining that you might be um, in Sydney, but you could be in any other of the fine cities um, as well. So thank you very much indeed, Social. Um, so, Shitra, I can see the questions are stacking up as well, so we really ought to press on. Let's take our next question, please. Our next question is from Mike. What are the main factors I must consider when choosing a project management methodology? All right, so we move from the binary to the more subtle. Mark, why don't you start us off and then we'll hear from Farah. Of course, you always have to take into account your current situation. And the maturity, the, the players uh, within this uh, project uh, have. Um, so uh, put in your current situation, and then it doesn't really matter which type of method you use. They're all similar. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So start from where you are. It's always a good place to begin a journey. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit like, you read some project management books and it's a bit like that old joke about, you know, stopping for directions in the pre satnav era where the person says, well, I wouldn't start from here if I were you. And you kind of think, well, <laughs> I've got to start from here. So very good, thank you. Uh, Farid, your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Tomas. So there is a, let's say, a component related to context if your project or uh, the topic you're working on it has a lot of uncertainty or not, whether it's a known topic for your team or not. There is also another component, which is the experience of your project team. And if they are willing to change their way of working, if you want to test something new, to test a new approach, whether it's a hybrid approach, a pure waterfall approach or a, a pure agile one. Uh, and third thing that pops into my mind is, uh, let's say, the culture of project management within your team. Uh, whether they are open to new things, whether they are open to, let's say, uh, build their own way of managing projects. So three things for me, if I summarize context, uncertainty or not, non-topic or not, experience of the project team, and third, the culture of project management or product management. Mm, very important, that cultural dimension, isn't it? Because no matter how good a fit, if the organization's not ready from an adoption perspective, then it's going to be rejected. It's a bit like trying to, you know, transplant something into an organization. The host really does want to, need to want to kind of take it on board. Thank you uh, very much, Farah. Uh, Tomas, your thoughts, and then Adrian. 
Uh, from my perspective, the very first um, factor that we need to consider is the size of the project or the duration of the project. Because waterfall methodology is, um, we call it heavy, right? But uh, there are a lot of different uh, aspects connected with the waterfall setup. So in order to have a very effective project, short project, you may resign from those, um, those comp uh, components, right? So size is, is the first, it's first, uh, the most important. Then I would say the re regulators and the regulations, the business regulations that we, we've discussed in the previous questions. And then um, the third point is the openness of the uh, organization to be agile. Because as you, uh, Nick, for example, mentioned about the government projects or, um, or other, other projects that can be opened for agile, it means that people, because at the end of the day, waterfall or agile, uh, or agile methodologies are um, the people who work on, on those projects, right? So if the people are open and people would like to experiment uh, with a, a more flexible methodology, we are in a good shape. If people are not open and people, from various reasons, don't want to explore agile, but we force them, it will be most likely a not successful uh, setup. So th those three three aspects: size, regulations, and the people. I would advise. Jeff. Yeah, thank you very much. This um, scope tends to come in quite a lot, doesn't it? You know, it affects people's thinking right from the very beginning. You know, if it's big and complicated, then, you know, people already have a kind of pendulum of risk and a pendulum of complexity. It tends to swing towards one particular approach over um, another. Um, let's hear from uh, Adrian next, and then we'll come to Orlando. Um, I'm going to address the elephant in the room here. <laughs> I think Nick's been waiting for this one. Uh, it comes from the title of this uh, of this particular session. Um, there is no such thing as a waterfall approach, and there can't be. Um, in fact, I before about four or five years ago, I never heard anyone talk about waterfall project management. Um, and I've also challenged uh, out there in social media for someone to actually show me something that says, this is a waterfall project management approach, and this is what defines it. Waterfall is a life cycle, and that's all it is. If you take all the components of anything that you might do in, in a quote, waterfall project management approach, they're all the same things done uh, in any other um, a, a, project management uh, uh, approach. And even if it comes down to, ah, oh, but you do things, you behave things uh, differently in a waterfall approach, where does it say that? No one has yet come back to me and says, this, this approach here, I can point you to the documentation, I can point you to the research that says, in a quote, waterfall environment, we behave differently. It's rubbish. Uh, and there's no evidence for it. Where this comes from is certain people in the agile software space who've got a vested interest in taking agile software techniques and force feeding them into fields like marketing, project management, engineering, construction, uh, and saying you can do Scrum and you can replace project management with Scrum. It's utter nonsense and they use waterfall to mean traditional old slow inefficient bureaucratic it sorry folks it's rubbish um you can a project management agility is about the whole of project management it's about an awful lot more than the life cycle i feel better now well, that's good. That's really good. I feel that we've we've somehow or another kind of uncorked the genie now, okay, from the bottle. So thank you. Thank you for that, Adrian. I am going to come back to you, though, with my three wishes, of course, momentarily, all right, <laughs> so that you can try and help me through that. But I do agree with that. I think that, you know, so much of us as uh, human beings, we are creatures of habit. And so we tend to fall into 
these um, uh, little buckets, if you like, that says, oh, yes, you, you know, these are a collection of behaviors that I might identify with, that I have witnessed previously, that I have contributed to previously. And so we tend to form these little tribes and one tribe becomes increasingly known by this label and another increasingly known by um, its alternative. Um, Orlando, your thinking before we get into what those three wishes, that would be a great title for a show, the three wishes to put to yeah. a project, <laughs> project, program or portfolio manager. I'll come back to that one, Adrian. Orlando, your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, but, um, so I wanted to add to, uh, to Thomas, um, my experience in my ABN AMRO time in, in the Netherlands was that uh, while we had to uh, shorten the duration of the projects uh, because they were kind of large and, and, and complex during a long time for uh, one, two, three years, uh, we said uh, at that time, we said, OK, our projects cannot take any longer than nine months. And that me meant that uh, projects started to be uh, to get more um, uh, less uh, to less complex and um, to have less dependencies. And that meant that the possibility to be success, to create a successful uh, project um, uh, increased a lot. So um, uh, one of the tips uh, from ex my experience is shorten your project uh, time to get, uh, to get out, uh, to diminish complexity and to diminish uh, uh, dependencies. Thank you very much, Adi, some great thinking. Uh, Mark, final thoughts on this before we move on? Yeah, just a reply to uh, Adrian. Uh, uh, I'm a big fan of Agile. Uh, I think we're born Agile, otherwise you won't survive. And the same applies to being a project manager. If you don't have the Agile mind, you won't survive and you won't have a lot of fun in, in helping and facilitating projects. Um, so Agile is just uh, uh, the next step of waterfall. It's just mini waterfall. Absolutely right. Yes. Absolutely right. Thank you very much, indeed. And of course, you know, there's a lots of different ways to think about this. And I think as people's career progress, you move away from this kind of thinking of the binary. It's, you know, us versus them, or it's this versus that, or the reason why this project is very political is because of this, you know, single, you know, factor or that kind of thing. And you get into much more of a nuanced, you know, sort of position where you begin to see clearly for the first time how the rituals that are embedded and explicit within um, agile approaches in the agile um, manifesto become apparent in our day-to-day -day work regardless of the project management methodology that we're following so excellent points thank you very much um indeed panel so Chitra, i think we need to move on let's take our next question if we can we have a live viewer question from Niraj. It can be difficult to predict efforts such as cost, time, and resources at the beginning of the project in Agile. What's the best approach to handle this? Mm, because often as an exec sponsor, you are wanting to kind of see something. You, you need some sort of confidence about you know, what you're getting into. Um, Thomas, how would you approach this challenge? Uh, yeah, first things first, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, and I would uh, like to um, tell that it is, it is uh, hard to define cost, time, and resources at the beginning of each project. It doesn't matter if it's you know, a more flexible, agile, or more governed. It is very difficult in IT environments, right? So the only thing, and it, it, is, it is not working 100%, uh, but the only thing we can predict is that by having similar project that uh, in the past, right? So because we sort of did that, so we most likely uh, know how uh, the size and how 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 far uh, that would go. And now, um, how to handle that? Yeah, from my perspective, the best way to handle that is to give the autonomy to the teams to decide and to estimate um, that uh, the, that effort, right? and not to challenge because in the um, huge corporations we may have these behaviors like you know 
PMs coming to developers and saying, oh, you know, this project, your estimations are too high. You need to cut it by half because our stakeholders want us to do so. So not to do it, right? Because we need to believe our uh, key technical people that their estimations are more or less correct, right? Still, those are the estimations or some people say guesstimations. We can't predict in 100%, but the worst thing that we can do is just say, oh, you know, I feel that it's too much. You overestimated that. We need to rely on those on those folks, despite on the, on the methodology we choose. It's very important, isn't it, to, you know, if you go and ask a question with sincerity and with humility, if you ask an expert a question, if the answer that they provide to you is not the answer that you're looking for, then the first place to consider is, did you ask the right question? <laughs> Did you ask the right question in the first place? You know, it's like if you go on chat GPT and you, you just say, tell me the best one of these, it's, you get a very different answer if you, if you seed chat GPT with, as an expert, give me the best view on this, or as uh, a beginner, give me the best view on this. So context becomes everything for your question and supporting technical colleagues, particularly when they're estimating time and effort is a very, very important thing. And it's an iterative type of approach. Very good point. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Farah, your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Mark. Well, first, I totally agree with what Tomas had just said uh, when it comes to uh, having, let's say, uh, a, the possibility to align or to have an overview of what happens previously so that you can input this into your, your estimation. But what's for sure it can, it, is that you, you definitely can't predict efforts. You can make forecasts, but you can't predict them. And there is another component that's uh, important, uh, if I can say. It's the fact that your stakeholders need to understand that whatever costs you have forecasted, whatever, let's say, uh, time you have forecasted, it might change. The plan might change. They have to, to keep in mind this and they have to be as much flexible as possible according to this by working on the perimeter, by working on the priorities, etc. So there is also a kind of, let's say, uh, psychological approach to have when it comes to this kind of forecast as well to make sure that your stakeholders are also aware that nothing is let's say put uh, le let's say or signed by blood there are some uncertainties and this is why i say it's not a prediction it's a forecast Indeed, yeah, absolutely. And um, understanding that language is everything. It's quite fascinating to me as um, you know, somebody with a STEM background, how, how many charts I see um, that have very little in the way of illustration around the degree of confidence that somebody has. <laughs> when they're doing an estimate or suggesting, you know, that this is what the future may look like. Very rare to see confidence bars on the charts, isn't it? Let's be honest with each other. And then occasionally what you do at the end is, you know, in eight point lettering is our contingency is 10%. Well, good luck with that because my ability to accurately forecast anything plus or minus 10% is somewhat limited. <laughs> so, so anyway, so very good. Thank you, uh, Farah. Uh, let's hear from Mark next and then Adrian. Well, it depends what you are creating, what the end product will be. So scope is a very uh, uh, important thing to take into account. And then just ask what your project sponsor or your business executive is willing to pay for. And how, wh when does he need it? And that has a, a, a huge uh, uh, impact on the scope. Yeah, I most definitely agree with that. You need to facilitate with the exec sponsor or whoever the project initiator is. It's an involved conversation. It's it's not a five minute sit down or responding to an email. You know, if you're going to initiate something, then um, a lot of people have a, might have a very clear vision, but they're not always able to articulate it to the degree of granularity that you need in order to be able to provide a professional advisory service. So don't be afraid to go back and ask some really good questions, again, in a polite and a you know, respectful fashion. But do facilitate that conversation because I, I can assure you that 
often senior people don't haven't fully thought things through. They, they have a sense of what it is that they want to achieve. But they don't necessarily know the detail of it at that point. So facilitation is vital. Adrian, your thoughts? Yeah, just uh, I hope hopefully a quick one. Um, projects are about delivering value and you need to define that value in some way. And that's usually a business case, not always, but usually a business case. And the Iron Triangle, 50-something years old, I think is still valid, time, cost, quality, or time, cost, scope, whichever way you do it. Uh, my take on adapting agility to that, yeah, which, which actually I know that a lot of senior uh, execs and especially finance folk like, is to fix in as much as you ever fix any of those three parameters. You fix time and cost and then you say, well, what's the minimum scope that we have to deliver to make this project viable? Uh, and then you try and deliver better than that if you can. And picking up on what Mark says, yeah, by all means, challenge the envelope and say to the business, look, how much are you willing to spend? How far are you willing to go in order to get as much value out of this as possible? But still at the end of that, uh, to me, a nice agile approach is to say, let's fix time and cost and then have a minimum scope to, to deliver and then deliver against that. Try and do That's better. That's a really good, yeah, that is a really good bridge, isn't it? For people who are steeped in that world, you know, to be able to get them to kind of think about that minimum minimum viable product or that outcome you know that it is that they're looking for that mvp kind of outcome yeah really good thank you adrian um orlando your thoughts yeah yeah i'd like to add something because um uh, let's uh, realize that it's not about a plan but it's about planning as eisenhower said it's about working together to understand what what kind of value you are um, trying to um, to build, and uh, it's the process of making that. And another uh, important um, uh, aspect of uh, working uh, agile is just enough design upfront, and don't um, 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 go into too much detail upfront, even though your senior or your business sponsor is asking for that. And I know this is one of the hardest uh, uh, issues to realize and to stay to get this senior leader with this detail of questions uh, uh, into your project. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, Tomas, uh, final thoughts on this, and then we'll move on. Uh, Thomas, can we? Can you hear us? Yeah. Oh yeah, yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, what I can just say uh, to summarize what we discussed is keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. Yeah, don't do the assumptions. Don't pretend that you understood what your stakeholders want. Just keep talking, keep asking questions, and updating your uh, estimations. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. And if you're in that role of trying to coach up, then be true to yourself. You know, speak truth to power is an important thing to bear in mind. If you're asked your opinion, then provide your opinion and be open and honest about it and provide evidence where you are able to, to support that opinion. Because I can assure you, senior leaders want to hear the truth. Okay. They do not want to hear what you imagine they might want to hear, okay? They actually respect you if you're able to tell them the truth. So very good, so interesting. Thank you very much indeed, panel. Let's move on to Chitra. Uh, we've got questions really stacking up now, so let's press on. We have a live question from Min Liu. Why are there more than 110 agile delivery frameworks in use across the world? <laughs> 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 well, my goodness me, Milvio, thank you so much. Uh, regular supporter of, of uh, Level Up and of APMG. Thank you for asking the question. Very insightful. Um, let's whiz around the panel really quickly. Your thoughts, please, uh, Adrian, then we'll hear from Orlando. Okay. First of all, it comes back to what agile, and I, I don't know, but I suspect most of, the, um, uh, of these are uh, different flavors of agile software development approaches. Um, you, you could just 
loads of them, so I won't go into that. But also, uh, there are adapt adaptations of Agile, multiple ones in the project management space, surprise, surprise. But they're also in Agile marketing, Agile finance, Agile engineering, Agile consulting, da 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 So that's, that's a lot of reason why. Oh, by the way, and some of them are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I, Not think, mine. I think it's really mine no. is really <laughs> <laughs> I was I was gonna say I was gonna say we might come to yours in a few moments. Well at least your philosophy, your your way of approaching things, Adrian, we might come to that in a moment. But um uh, I do think that, you know, there's a bit of a wave and it's been rolling around, you know, the oceans of um uh knowledge management now for some years. And um, people use the Agile term and they insert it into an approach. And it's not always genuinely original thought. It's often a hybridized version of something else. So a discerning um, researcher will be able to figure that out um, pretty quickly. For somebody who's early in their career, you may want to try and baseline you know, the, um, your research and try and get, you know, some triangulation from others, put it that way, uh, to be able to determine, you know, which ones are appropriate for you. Um, Orlando, your thoughts, and then we'll go to Mark. Yeah, I, there, I love the answer of uh, Adrian. So <laughs> that's great. Yeah, so um, my uh, suggestion would be look at the, um, uh, the ones which are, uh, um, uh, Concise described. Uh, I love uh, in that sense Scrum because it started with 18 pages and now maybe it is 20 pages. And um, because of that, it's hard to implement, uh, but it's very simple in its essence. And because there's less described, prescribed, uh, you are really uh, urged to collaborate. Uh, with each other to get it impl uh, implemented. On the contrary, we have uh, SAFE, which is very uh, broadly and extensively described. So uh, everyone is going to ask, okay, what is being described in the SAFE uh, framework instead of start thinking themselves and start, uh, start uh, collaborating and uh, understanding each other and understanding the context in which you are going to implement it. So I love the, 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 the short uh, the, and concise uh, frameworks. Thank you very much indeed. And I think the, 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 the more experience we get, the more that we are indeed attracted to those concise approach because we're able to recognize a framework as a framework and not as a project management method, if you like. And I think early in your career, it's a little bit tricky to clearly define um, where does this particular advice fit in that spectrum. Um, so let's go next, um, if we can, and um, I do apologize, I've lost my thread a little bit. Oh yes, I remember. Mark, let's go to Mark and then we'll hear from Tomas. Oh, uh, brilliant question, but I think it's worse. There are much more delivery methods out there and there are a lot of ways to get to a place. Um, there are a lot of different sectors where we have uh, changes and projects. And then stepping back, maybe two steps, looking at all the delivery methods, they're sort of the same. You look at it, you do an analysis, you come up with a sort of a, so a solution and you test it. And if it works, you go for it. And that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's a really good advice there. And uh, Tomas, final thoughts? Yeah, my, my final thought is that uh, yet another elephant in the room. <laughs> so uh, from my perspective, we have a lot of different methods because pretty much everyone wants to invent the, the ideal methods. And there is no ideal method uh, that, that we, we can have, right? Yeah, from my perspective, uh, the most valuable for me are two approaches, Agile PM or the um, Agile Project Management from APMG, and then pure, pure Scrum in the Scrum Guide. And both are for different, different um, situations and different uh, organizations, right? But one is the answer to the other. If in Scrum there is too less guidance and governance, there is Agile PM. If Agile PM is too heavy for a very small organization, there is a scrap. 
so those two are for me the most important. Uh, and obviously we have various different methods on the market. But if you see the details of it, there are all the um, components that have been used already somewhere else. It's just different naming, maybe different, there are slight differences, but in general, as we've uh, thought, uh, um, as we discussed on this panel, the bases are the same, right? So you need to be mindful and not to just, you know, switch the name from PA planning to you know, the other um, the other uh, ways of calling this meeting. But it is, there, there's a common ground that it's um, around us in terms of the agility. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Thomas. Some really good advice from everybody. Now, um, in my humble experience, having been a consultant for some time, I would say there are as many methods as there are um, project teams because teams tend to adapt and they bring something to the team and they'll say, well, you know, we did this on my last project or here's a thought for you. And then suddenly this new deliverable gets incorporated and then you have a conversation with the project management office and if they love it, then they adopt it and that becomes part of the normality, the BAU, if you like, over time for a given organisation. So I'm going to recommend two books for you as the audience to have a little look at. First of all, um, I want to recommend the um, Praxis Framework um, to you. It's actually um, online. So it's praxisframework.org. So it is online and you can go and visit that website and explore it for yourself. Um, but it is also so available as a publication for those people who like to use a physical text um, as your preferred method, if you like. And the other book that I'd like to recommend to you is actually um, authored by one of the team on the panel today. It's called Agile Beyond IT, and it really will help you if you are a fan of agile thinking and you want to try and apply the philosophy in real life, but you're thinking hard about how do I help my organization adopt um, agile ways of working, agile ways of thinking and behaving, then it's a fantastic place to begin that journey with. So do consider both of those publications. Others, of course, are available and you may have noticed the little plug in the background, um, shamelessly plugging those two, those two books as well for you. All right, very good. Um, so Chitra, I think we might have time for one or two more questions if we're hurry, um, if we hurry up. So let's take our next question, please. Sure. So our question is from Rodolfo. Have you ever encountered situations where a company is using a combination of waterfall and agile methodologies in a project? Okay, excellent question. Um, so Mark, start us off, then we'll hear from Orlando. Yeah, uh, one of my customers uh, uh, created uh, what they call Agifall. It's a combination of agile and waterfall, uh, uh, and it's hybrid. And most projects have hybrid aspects. You need a coordination, so that's what project management is all about. And then uh, when you are uh, creating your solution, just go for it. And in the beginning, you need to come up with um, uh, the design, and that's usually a, a very agile way of working. And then when you start realizing Excellent. the design, it's more wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. And I and I do like that, although um, in English, it kind of sounds a little bit like um, it's a problem. <laughs> okay, and, and you fall kind of, kind of sounds like you're heading in the wrong direction. Um, I do know another one of those, which is the kind of wagile kind of uh, concept, but I, I don't know, I don't know equally. So I'm not sure that that's ever going to really kind of take off if you like. Thank you, um, Mark. Orlando, your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Farah. Yeah, I what I see with my customers, I uh, uh, actually all of them are uh, struggling uh, with the hybrid situation and how should the, the agile way of working on the one hand and the project way of working cope together. And I believe that when uh, organizations are growing bigger uh, and larger, that they are struggling with it. And one of the uh, elements of it is uh, there are multiple teams and how work, do they work together? Um, and how is there any governance 
for prioritizing uh, the, the uh, overlaying priorities. And uh, well, you could uh, you could solve that with uh, project boards or with uh, product owner tables or with uh, increment teams, something like that. You have to have a coordinating board. Uh, but uh, my experience is that most organizations struggle with that. Um, in my opinion, that's one of the main trends for coming years. Thank you very much indeed. How you manage that governance and how you help the organization evolve and improve its project maturity. Really good points. Thank you, Orlando. Uh, Farry, your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Adrian. Thank you, Nick. Well, uh, in fact, when I see all these questions and all the discussions that we're having, I feel like uh, people are waiting us to give them the winner of the battle, as if Agile and other type of project management were, was, a, let's say, a big battle and we need to find the winner. Well, uh, in the reality, it's not that easy. Uh, I mean, uh, most of the projects I've been part of uh, have a combination of pure Agile principles and pure, let's say, uh, principles that come from our historic or traditional project management approaches. So first of all, keep in mind also that uh, people have their different, people have different grids of reading when it comes to agile, when it comes to more traditional project management or ways of uh, dealing with agile. So yes, you will find a lot of companies, a lot of projects that are managed into a hybrid mode. And it does not mean that they're not doing the thing right. It does not mean that they need to find the good side and to be on it. Sometimes it matches if you do 100% of agile. Sometimes you need more structured approach. Sometimes you need to make some more foundation or thinking at the beginning rather than just jump up and go into that uncertainty. So it's not a battle, it's up to your context and up to what you need to do, deliver. And if I come back I to what Adrian had just said uh, before, it's it depends on the value that you want to create. So if it's uh, with Agile that you are going to do it, let's go. If you do it with more traditional approach, let's do it. Most certainly true, Farah. And often the project manager is described as the um, uh, the conductor of an orchestra, you know, with the project team and the wider community of stakeholders and so on, all gathered, you know, to hear the live performance. And as the live performance evolves, you know, so the project manager is bringing in the different disciplines from, you know, the technical community, from the business analysts, from the business itself, from the stakeholder community, in order to form and forge the the very best performance from everybody, you know, and it's their role to be able to orchestrate that and bring out that talent at the right moments across that project life cycle. So thank you very much indeed. Final thoughts on this, Adrian? Yeah, the 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 organizations that I've seen do this the most successfully are those that have been able to separate the delivery approach from the project management wrap approach uh, and for example if you've got an if you've got an it enabled project um and the it delivery approach is being done with agile whether it's scrum or safe or or anything anything like that that's fine and then you've got the project management wrap around it which is which is different which you may or may not be doing in an agile way hopefully you will but also, if you've got something like construction in the UK, you've got the uh, Royal Institute of British Architects um, uh, 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 governing um, uh, method for delivering construction uh, projects. Um, and that's not software development. And it's also pretty difficult to actually make that uh, agile. But you can still actually put the project management wrap around that. And it's, it's different. So the companies that have been, organizations that have been successful are those that recognize there is a difference between the project management approach that's being wrapped around the delivery approach. And, hmm. and, and if, if both of those can be agile, then that's a win-win. But what where the ones that really screw up are the ones that say we've got an agile software development approach and we're going to bleed that into the project management and try and make it fit and that is almost always doomed to expensive failure and on that positive thank note you. <laughs> thank you very much indeed thank you adrian 
it's good to watch out for these things, isn't it? Because we want successful outcomes. You know, we want to have successful contributions and value, you know, to our organizations and to our teams as well. So it is good to know where those pitfalls might be so that we can navigate our way around them and genuinely learn lessons from our previous experience. So very good. Um, look, it's been a fast and furious event today with lots of emotion being shared both online and also from the panel as well. Some passion coming through, which is brilliant. Um, so let's hear closing remarks then, panel, if we may. Adrian, I will come to you first and then we'll hear from Orlando. Oh, Adrian, sorry, miles away. That I was just, I was just looking at someone being very, very kind in the in the social media, and I think, oh, lovely, how how lovely. Um, right. Well, two, three sentences. Uh, I'm just going to say, I really, uh, I'm only going to refer out to um, uh, my my own blog, Agile Beyond IT blog. Uh, there's uh, lots of stuff in there. Uh, I'm starting to also write about business agility in there as well. Um, so, and lots of people have made some fantastic sort of comments and feedback. They don't always agree with me, which is even better because, um, uh, which is which is great. So, um, thank you to a brilliant team today. Very lively. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Adrian. It's good to be able to stimulate people's thinking and also get their responses. And I, I really do agree with you there. It helps to, you know, sharpen us up. Um, Orlando, your closing remarks, please, and then we'll hear from Thomas. Yeah, I'd love to this uh, the, the discussion here. Uh, one book which is up, uh, although in Dutch, but is very much uh, lovely to read. Scaling Agile in Organizations. Um, I used to uh, promote. It's not mine, but it's uh, giving a broad uh, sense of all the kinds of agile ways of working and uh, compares them relatively easy. So um, sorry, not in English, but for the Dutch uh, listeners, yes, that's a good one. Yeah, Thank it is a really good nice one, and there's just no problem at all. Thank you, Orlando. And I know there's a growing community, not just of, you know, um, the uh, full spectrum of project management um, in the Netherlands, but also an agile PM community as well, which is uh, busy growing there. It's one of the fastest growing, actually, communities um, based on the Dutch language. So really great um, to have people join that. We'll try and put a link into the chat for both of those for you. Um, Thomas and then Farah. Uh, I would like to, uh, on the closing remark, I would like to come back to the uh, to the assumption of the project and product related organizations. So we are the people who produce products, right? Based on various different methodologies, based on various different aspects, but uh, we need to remember that we are the people who product uh, pro produce that. So despite of any roles that we use, it's very important for us to be aligned what we would like to achieve in the organization, the ways we would like to do it, and um, the stakeholders around us and the government uh, governance around us, right? So despite of the fight or the war, uh, as we discussed between you know, the old world versus new world and so on, this is not about that. This is all about people who work together. So remember about that. Thank Absolutely. Bring your best self to your work on a daily basis is absolutely the thing exactly. to be able to do, you know, and uh, that will transcend everything. Thank you so much, Tom Arts. That's a really insightful thing to say. Um, Farah and then Mark. Thank you, Nick. So there is also something else I can, uh, that I can add up to what has been said uh, until now is that find your own management, let's say value management approach. We're a lot speaking about project management approach, but it's much more a value management approach. Find, Try to find what makes you reach that value that expected from your stakeholders rather than just focusing on the method or on what is being said at the moment about Agile, about other other methods. Yeah, that's a really good concept, isn't it? Just think beyond the present moment. Think about that fact, that value, you know, that is going to be delivered. So fantastic. Thank you, Farah. Um, Mark, your closing remarks, please, and then we'll hear from Suchitra. Okay, uh, uh, just remember, humans are agile by nature. They can't help it. They have an agile mind. You just have to help them express it in the same dialect everybody else is speaking. 
in that hybrid or, 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 or more agile project management or other agile project management methods, even uh, uh, something like SAFE. And um, one of the things I encountered, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Henny Portman, he uh, came up with an, a bird's eye view on the agile forest. And he has one amazing picture with all the agile stuff that's out there in, in his picture. So um, I post the, the link and you will, you will get it out there. So that's really helpful. So thanks for the show. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today, Mark. It's been really, really good. And as a visual learner, I love that kind of thing where somebody's taken the time to illustrate, you know, what the landscape actually looks around a particular topic or a theme and bring it to life in words and pictures is amazing. So thank you. I'm definitely going to have a look at the bird's eye view on the agile forest. Thank you so much. Um, Suchitra, fast and furious today. Um, high blood pressure, moments of <laughs> <laughs> transcendence from the peak of excitement to the well i don't think we were in the valley of despair for very long we just said watch out for the gotchas is is that fair <laughs> yeah totally i think it was more than fast and furious we've had so many questions that have piled up and uh, but not to worry we have a couple of more agile uh, related events coming up this month so stay, stay tuned and watch out all right. Okay. Very good indeed. Thank you. And thank you to Suchitra uh, for navigating us all through the sea of questions that we had today. It was a, or bordering on a tsunami, actually, um, that we had coming in. So thank you very much indeed um, for your work. And uh, of course, um, on behalf of the panel, thank you to all of our producers online for putting in those questions and joining in so actively in the chat today. It is a community activity that we're doing, and it's brilliant. Um, that you're able to join us and help us out um, as you all are. Very good. Well, let's move on um, a little bit if we can do. Um, I'd like to um, just remind everybody that over on our website, you can, of course, search for the answers to more than 1,500 or so questions that have been previously submitted on Level Up shows and our Midday Mentors series and also the podcasts led by our CEO, Richard Farrow. Uh, it's a brilliant free resource that connects you with more than 200 experts now from all over the world in different disciplines. And don't forget on that note that you can also listen to the audio versions of the Level Up shows on your preferred podcast platform. Just search for APMG International Level Up Your Career and you will find us. Now, um, in the next week or so, we're going to take a little break. Um, we always do this each Easter weekend. So it's a two episode break. So there will not to be a level up this Friday or indeed the following Monday. But we are due to return on Friday the 14th of April when we're going to be looking at how to create double the value from your projects in only half of the time. So it sounds crazy, but actually it's really true. And there's a really excellent, deep evidence base to support those comments if you follow a particular approach. So do tune in for that. Um, and don't worry um, if you're going to miss us over the Easter weekend and you're out and about walking and so on. Um, you can always either listen to the podcast versions or indeed head over to our YouTube channel and please like and subscribe to the videos um, over there. Um, Last thing to say is a bit of a shout out for registering yourself if you'd like to appear um, as a panelist in the future. Um, there's a little link which is going to appear in the chat. So do click on that and then you can sign up and we will send you a personal summary of what's coming up on Level Up and um, how you too, of course, can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. So thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you back here again on the 14th of April.